Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. With South Africa's logistics crisis destroying growth and jobs, business is being integrated into the work of the National Logistics Crisis Committee. Terence Kumi joins me to discuss the implications. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. What is the National Logistics Crisis Committee and why was it formed? Well, it's been formed basically because of the collapsing performance of Transnet and to a secondary uh, sort of level, also price as we know, that's also collapsed very badly. But mostly it's around freight logistics. And we know that over the last couple of years, and especially since COVID, we've had this declining trend on a number of uh, the key corridors. It's been notable, I think, especially on the, the, uh, the North Corridor, which uh, involves um, the transport of coal but also the corridor that transports chrome and manganese ore. Those have been very badly affected. And this is a combination of crime, vandalism, cable theft that hasn't been managed very well around the infrastructure. I think a, a lack of skill within Transnet's also come to the fore. Um, there are concerns also about Transnet governance at the moment, so that's also come to the fore. And then there's been this really protracted impasse related to the, the uh, locomotives, particularly with the Chinese supplier CRC, which leading to more and more uh, locomotives standing idle and not really being operational, which has affected uh, the, uh, some of those corridors very, very acutely. So it's, it's really about the performance and it's affecting gross domestic product. Well, obviously load shedding is in everyone's public imagination because it affects us directly in our homes. There's sort of very poor performance of Transnet is less visible to the normal public, but its economic impact is quite significant. And there's been figures being released this week in the public domain of over 6% knock on our gross domestic products. So it's very significant. It's, it's the similar size to what we're seeing with the load shedding crisis. Business, including two high profile CEOs have joined the initiative. Yes, now the president met with CEOs, a high profile meeting over the last couple of weeks and it was agreed that they were going to have uh, participate in sort of three focus areas. We know about the National Energy Crisis Committee, NECOM, and business's role within that. And this is now the second committee that uh, business has agreed to participate in. And then there's a crime and corruption committee that's also going to be established. But on this transport committee or logistics crisis, uh, we've got high level uh, CEO representatives coming through Polisi and Goja, the former CEO of Exaro, is going to be one of those. Andrew Kirby of, of Toyota. Uh, they'll be the sort of high profile, almost the CEO level, and there'll be counterparts from a ministerial level that are still being assembled. This committee itself will be chaired by the, the, the president and will meet on a six weekly rotation. So it's, it's, it's sort of heavyweight uh, participation. Uh, and also there's a lot of technical resources behind both business and slowly being assembled also from the government side, probably at a uh, director general or deputy director general level. So, and then there's also some outside advisors that are coming from the private sector or academia into this. So it's one of these committees that's, that business is, is participating in directly. And like NECOM, which is focused on the load shedding crisis, there's going to be a sort of a, a sort of collaborative approach from from business from the private sector, and the uh, the resources that have been mobilised and are funded by business about 100 million rand. Some of those resources are also going to be directed to this committee. How will the committee approach its work? Well, I think there's going to be a focus on some of the immediate uh, crises or emergencies that have emerged particularly around cable theft, prices, volume collapse, uh, but also on, on certain corridors. And I think we need to see uh, that work program. It hasn't been fully finalized. The terms of reference on the process are being shared between the, the private sector and government and should be signed off very soon. So there's going to be a focus on those immediate corridors that are really failing and uh, are really having a bad impact in terms of the economy and job creation. Uh, as well as on, on Prasa, from what it sounds like, uh, there's going to be some emphasis there as well. But there's also going to be a parallel, some of the reform agenda that's being uh, operated under the aegis of Operation Vulandlela, some of that is also going to be folded into this crisis committee. 
So there's going to be a sort of parallel work on the emergencies and then on the longer term uh, reform agenda as well. So it's, it's uh, got a number of areas that are going to be, have to be tackled simultaneously. How will the influence of business be managed, particularly where conflicts of interest could arise? Yes, I think this is coming up more and more. I think while there's some gratitude that business is putting up its hand to help government, there is a growing concern about the role of business uh, displacing government and displacing what government should be doing and sort of picking up the pieces. And I think uh, in this case, I think it is an emergency situation. It's clear there are skills, lack, uh, there's skills lacking, or there's gaps uh, lacking and expertise uh, lacking. And we've seen quite a lot of success, I think, in Operation Vulundlela and at NECOM, where those gaps have been closed. But as you say, it's, it's a major risk that the tail starts wagging the dog. And I think if that uh, is not managed um, and the private sector starts calling the policy shots, there's going to be a major backlash towards NECOM, towards this crisis committee, towards the crime and corruption crisis committee. And managing this, I think, when it comes to the reform agenda, I think they're going to have to make sure that the government plays the lead role there, that there might be, you know, uh, sounding boards, but the, the private sector cannot be calling the shots when it comes to th third party access to the railways and to the ports. We know that already Transnet is moving in this direction and uh, the initial steps have not been very favourably received by the, the private sector, but particularly on the rail side uh, when they had some slot sales. There's now a big concession process around the, um, the container uh, corridor between Joburg and Durban. In fact, I didn't mention that earlier. That is a big crisis and we can see there's just more and more trucks on the road. But that, that issue, uh, a third party access to the railway network has to be driven by the public sector, has to be driven, driven by the policy makers. And uh, there have to be guardrails put in place to ensure that this, this isn't penetrated and is a north, new form of, of corporate capture, as some call it, or state capture. So there are these concerns. I think when this comes to the emergency, uh, the, the, the sort of emergency issues around the coal corridor and also around some of our border posts at the moment, there I think those can be managed and the private sector's role will be valued. But when it comes to the more reform agenda, I think there has to be a, a spotlight on this committee, huge levels of transparency. Because if there isn't a high level of transparency, there's going to be a lot of questions raised when some of these reforms start taking place. I think one of the safeguards is that these committees are really interlocutors of government and business associations and academia rather than particular companies. But there is a concern and it, I think that it has been acknowledged to a certain extent across all the committees, but I think there needs to be more emphasis uh, from the government side in particular to show how the guardrails are in place, what safeguards are in place so that we don't have some form of new corporate or state capture emerging from these processes. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our Engineering News Daily Email Newsletter.